Now, in that management responsibilities, one of the things that you are going to create is what they call the management plan. This is your plan that you would submit to your client that would explain how you intend to manage his property. Some agents use the management plan as a marketing tool, much like a listing agent would go into a house and say, here's what I'm going to do when I list your property and give them a plan of, we're gonna market here, we're gonna market there. This is the same concept. You would approach a uh, investor and say, I want to manage your property. Here's what we do. Here's our management plan that would show you what we're going to do so that you choose our company. In that plan is going to be a list of all the financial reports that you are going to potentially provide your client. And we touched on those reports or that accounting system once prior. So let's look at it just so I can remind you guys. Remember we had operating, uh, we had gross operating income, we subtracted expenses to get the net operating income, then we minus the debt service to get cash flow. We used this equation a couple different times. So using that equation, you can obviously see as a property manager that you can go in and supply your client with a net income report. All right, you can show him how much income he's either made annually or monthly. And because of that, you can also show him an expense report where all of the expenses came in. And there are two types of expenses. There's fixed and variable. Fixed expenses are things that stay relatively flat as far as their cost. Like payroll might be a good example of a fixed expense. There's always two employees working, two, you know, an office manager and a leasing agent. Variable would be like repairs. Well, this year it's different than it was last year. Capital improvements, we put a new roof on. So those are all some of the kinds of reports. Plus you can obviously see there's a gross income report you could give. You can give a cash flow report if you're paying his bills for him or paying his mortgage. That's the one I want to talk about. And in that cash flow report, that would this would be the check that would then go to your client. Works like an eraser if I hold it wrong. Found that trick. Now, you can also compare different years. So you can do, you know, last year's cash flow versus this year's cash flow. You can do profit and loss analysis. You can also do budget comparisons where you estimated the expenses at the beginning of the year. And then at the end of the year, you have actual expenses. So you can start to see trends in your property as if they're trending up or trending down. So with this one equation that we've used in two other chapters, these are strong tools that a property manager would be able to use to help his client understand what's going on with their property. Now, in the renting of the property, that's once again, that's going to be the leasing agent. And they may be an in house leasing agent, like one of the people in the office, or it could be a third party company that the manager has hired to do just the leasing. Once again, different skill sets. Okay. However, when the lease rate gets set and the $24,000 or $64,000 question of the day is who sets the rental rates? 
Who sets the rental rates? The owner? Cameron, you're good for one. The owner? Say it again. The owner. The owner. I repeated that. Do you think that's true? The market? Who truly sets the rental rates, Cameron? Let me ask you a question. An apartment building, an apartment building sitting on Fifth Avenue of New York City. You take that same building and you move it to Center Grove. Who sets the rental rates? The market sets the rental rates. Yeah, the market does. Okay. However, Cameron is correct on one part. The market sets the rental rates, but it still has to be a rental rate that will provide a return for the investor. It has to cover all of the fixed and variable expenses, and it has to be in line with all of the market that surrounds it. And like I said, the example is take a building on New York in New York on Fifth Avenue, set it in Indianapolis, you do not get the same rental rates. Why not? Same building, same owner, different market. All right. So the market sets the rental rates, even though it still has to cover expenses, still has to make the investor a return on his money, all of that. Now, when you're looking at your properties, there is this thing called vacancy. And right now we're just going to talk about the simple standard vacancy it's properties empty what would you rather have a property now let's assume we're talking 60 70 100 units not one or two would you rather have a property that's 90 percent occupied or 100 percent occupied 90 percent or 100 percent vote one or two most people out of the gate would go, I want 100%. What does 100% occupied mean about your apartment? There's not room to go. It means your rental rates are too low. If you've got an all 600 units apart rented, you are renting for too low. So your vacancy rate, which is the inverse of occupancy rate. If my occupancy rate was 90, my vacancy rate is 10%. Everybody see what I'm getting at? Occupancy versus vacancy. The national average that most association of property managers try to gear towards is 94 to 95% occupied. They want that one or two vacant so that if someone comes in and they're renting at 500, they could go, oh, well, this one's 550. And then if that person takes it, then as they slowly roll out the other $500 a month people, they start bringing them in at 550. But if your apartment is 100% occupied, typically most managers are gonna tell you your rents are too low, bump them up, all right? So 94 to 95% occupancy is what most property managers like to gear towards. And typically in the residential world, they market properties based on a monthly rent, 900 a month, 1,000 a month. However, in the commercial world, it is done slightly different. It is typically given as a square footage and I'm going to tell you for our market, it is based on an annual basis. So what you will see is something like this, $3 per square foot. This allows a tenant to kind of compare property. So if they see one that's $3.50 per square foot, you can kind of get a comparison on the value. Now, obviously I understand that this one may be 3,000 square feet, 
and this one only may be a thousand, so your overall monthly cost is going to be different. But they give these in this kind of fashion. It's a rental rate. So it's a dollar per square foot. All right. So let's have some more math fun today. If I had a property that was, or a room I was renting out, 25 by 40, and I'm charging $8 a square foot, my question to you is, what's my monthly rent? What's my monthly rent? $8,000. Yes, I should do that. Yes, I should do this. I heard an answer of $8,000. Is that correct? Because I got you on the whole trick again. Remember, this is an annual. So it's $8,000 per year. I asked you monthly rent. That was really a bad example for me to pick. So watch for that on the test where they're giving you a rental rate and then asking you for monthly rent. Once again, they love that conversion to make sure it's the same thing trick we did with the ad valorem tax. So remember that. There's all kinds of activities that would be involved in property management, marketing. Marketing would be one of the activities. You've got to market the property, which involves advertising. Advertising is just one form of marketing, okay? There are many other ways to market property other than advertisement. Now, because this deals with housing, remember we still have fair housing issues as a property manager. You can at no time ever advertise any discriminatory comments. And because we're licensed as a property manager, remember that exclusion potentially? If a, a licensed person was not involved, well, you've got a property manager, so now they are involved. So do not forget that you have to comply with fair housing just like you would in the brokerage. It is not solely buying and selling, it's also lessor and lessee issues. 